4.3, the first derivative tells you two important things. The first derivative tells you where the function's increasing and where it's decreasing. And it helps you identify where there are relative extrema. Those things can be told from the first derivative. The second derivative tells you about concavity. And let's get the big, ugly, official definition of concavity. Um, if f is differentiable on an open interval i, the graph is concave up if f prime is increasing on the interval and concave down if f prime is decreasing on the interval. That makes no sense to me until I see a picture. All right, so let's look at this picture. I have a piece of a graph that's concave up. And I could have looked at that without that definition and said that graph seems like it would hold water over that interval right there. It's concave up. But what do you notice about the slope of the tangent line everywhere the graph is concave up? The tangent line is getting steeper. That means the um, derivative is increasing because the tangent line is getting steeper. And wherever the function is concave down, the derivative is decreasing. It's becoming more negative, or it's becoming steeper in a negative direction. So wherever the derivative is increasing, the function is concave up. Wherever the derivative is decreasing, the function's concave down over that interval. Theorem 4.7 gives us the test for concavity. Let f be a function whose second derivative exists on some open interval i. So we're going to have to find second derivatives. And today in the examples, I'm just going to tell you what I got for the second derivative. If the second derivative is positive, greater than 0, then the graph is concave up on that interval. If the second derivative is negative, the graph is concave down on that interval. Because think of what this is saying. If you're the, the first, the definition of concavity said where the first derivative is increasing. Well, if the first derivative was the original function and we wanted to know where it was increasing and decreasing, we would take its derivative and find the critical numbers and determine where the second derivative was positive or negative. That's all this is saying. Where the second derivative is positive, your first derivative is increasing, therefore the function's concave up. Where the second derivative is negative, your first derivative's decreasing, so the function's concave down. One more thing in the book. Definition of point of inflection on page 232. Yep, 232, right there. A point of inflection is just where the concavity changes. So if the function goes from being concave up to concave down at some point C, then that point C is an inflection point or the X value of an inflection point. I go back and mention, if I go ahead and mention 4.9, then I won't have to come back to it later. Last theorem that's important in this section. We already have a way of finding relative max and min. If we're going to find the first, the critical points of the first derivative and put them on a number line to determine where the function's increasing and where it's decreasing, then we already have a way of determining relative max and relative min without some new theorem that does the same thing. Theorem 4.9, the second derivative test, tells us something, but it's something that we could have figured out without it. We already knew how to find relative max or min. The second derivative test just gives us another way of finding relative max and min. It says if C is a critical number of the, um, if, if C, makes the first derivative zero, 
and the second derivative is positive at C, then positive second derivative means upward concavity. What, are, what is going on where you have upward concavity, a max or a min? A min. So wherever the second derivative is positive, there's going to be a relative min. Wherever the second derivative is negative, that's downward concavity. You have downward concavity, you have a relative max. So make sure you go back and look at those theorems tonight before you start the homework. Make sure, you're, make sure you understand what they're telling you. And then let's see how many examples we can get done. And then I'll tell you exactly what the homework is. We already know the homework's going to be finish 4.3. So 4.3 is due. Um, I'm fixing to write it down for you. Um, when I find exactly where I wrote it down. Ah, here it is. This is the first part of what I'm taking up Friday, and I'm not taking up anything before this. Um, 43 through 59 odd. I'll take that up and then we'll just see how far we get on 4.4 and I'll tell you which problems I'll take up from that section. All right. Let's look at number 22. with an easy polynomial. And always read the directions. That's a good thing. Number 22 says find the points of inflection and discuss the concavity of the graph of the function. So this, this um, problem is going to have three parts of an answer, just like last night. If I had put that on the test last night, I would have made part A tell where the function's increasing, part B tell where it's decreasing, part C tell if where there are relative extrema. On this problem, part A would be tell where it's concave up, part B would be tell where it's concave down, part C would be list your points of inflection. So it's going to look very much like last night's homework, only we're, we're talking about concavity rather than increasing or decreasing. The first derivative of that function is 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. And... I'm going to skip some steps here. When you factor that as completely as possible, you get 6 times x minus 2 times x plus 1. So what are the critical numbers for that first derivative? Positive 2 and negative 1. If those are critical numbers, they are possible relative extrema but I won't know if whether or not they are relative extrema unless I put them on a number line and then chose numbers in each interval to see if the function changed from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. If I stopped right now and put those on a number line and used three test points, I, I would be doing last night's homework. But since we're not looking for that, we're looking for concavity, I'm going to go ahead and take the second derivative. The second derivative is 12x minus 6 or 6 times 2x minus 1. So what 
are the critical numbers for the second derivative? One half. Critical numbers for the first derivative are possible relative extrema. Critical numbers for the second derivative are possible inflection points. I just want to put um, all three of those critical numbers on a number line. Negative one, one half, and two. And look at the sign of the second derivative. Make sure you're labeling that. We're looking at the sign of the second derivative. To the left and to the right of its critical number. Its critical number was one half. So I'm just, I just need one test point to the left of one half and one test point to the right of one half. To the left of one half, maybe zero. What would the sign of the second derivative be if I let x be 0? Negative 1 times 6 would be negative 6. So yeah, it's negative to the left of 1 half. What about to the right of 1 half? If I let x be 1, then the second derivative would be positive. That already tells me where the um, function is concave up and where it's concave down. Wherever the second derivative is positive, there is upward concavity. So where is the second derivative positive? One half, for, no, actually forever to the right. The, the sign of the second derivative only changes at one half. Anything bigger than one half, all the way to infinity, the second derivative is going to be positive. So it doesn't just stop at two. Anything to the left is negative. Anything to the left of one half is going to make the second derivative negative. So it's concave up from one half to infinity, and it's concave down from negative infinity to a half. And all I'm asked for in this problem is discuss the concavity. Well, we're through with that. We're through with discussing concavity. Is there an inflection point? Yes, where? One half, because the definition of inflection point is where the concavity changes. This, this function was concave down, and then it became concave up at a half. So there's an inflection point. at one half, and where would you get the y value of that inflection point? In the original function. And I'm just going to tell you that I've already found it to be negative 3 over 2. If this problem had asked me about relative max and min, I could say something about that now. But I'm going to just save that question for a minute because problems coming up, number 43 through 70, I am going to have to answer that question. Ms. Sarah? Uh, why is this the critical part of the... I, I realized that that, that that was going to throw you off. Even, if, even as I was putting negative 1 and 2 on the number line, I thought, oh, no, that's going to throw them off. It would be helpful if I were talking about relative extrema. However, in this problem, I'm not talking about relative extrema, so I could have just as easily left those off and just put the critical number of the second derivative on, on the number line. So, we yeah, so, it, so if I had written in pencil, I would just erase that negative 1 and 2 until we get to problems that also ask us for extrema. 
All right. Number 24. I don't have time to write it down, so I'm just going to tell you something. I'll show you where I wrote it down. Um, actually, yeah, just look at this. You don't have to copy it down. It makes sense. Not that one. That one. It's another polynomial function, so it's easy to find the first derivative. It's easy to find the second derivative. The second derivative is 24x squared. What can you tell me about the sign of 24x squared for any value of x? Anything other than 0, it's going to be positive. What does that mean about concavity of the graph? It, it's always concave up. If the first derivative, second derivative is positive everywhere, then this graph is concave up everywhere. And if the concavity doesn't change, what does that tell you about inflection point? You don't have one. There isn't one. If your concavity doesn't change, then there's no inflection point. So let's move on to one that's a little bit uglier. Uh, next one I had, oh yeah, number 32. Let's play with cosecant. We're only talking about this function on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. One revolution of the unit circle, not including the endpoints. Um, let me see. Just, again, I'm going to write down what I got for the derivative. But just tell me, um, what is the derivative of cosecant ugly? Um, negative cosecant ugly, cotangent ugly, derivative of the ugly. And the derivative of this ugly would be 3 halves. So when I cleaned it all up, for the first derivative, I got negative 3 cosecant ugly cotangent ugly. Is there any number for which cosecant is zero? Think about the graph of cosecant. Is it ever zero? No. It's those concave up or concave down parabola looking things that don't touch the x-axis. So there's nothing that makes that zero. What about cotangent? Where would cotangent be zero? Wherever the x, wherever the x divided by y, is zero. Where is the x divided by the y zero? That's half pi's. That's half pi's, such as half um, the pi over two. The ordered pair is zero one. Zero divided by one is zero. So cotangent is zero with the half pi's. Um, let me write it this way. It's already factored completely as possible, so I'm just going to say that doesn't equal zero for any value of x, and this equals zero at the half pi's, that's when three halves pi, or when three halves x equals either pi over two or um, three halves pi. We don't have to use the pi over two in two n plus one. We don't have to just say odd half pi's because we're only talking about one revolution of the unit circle and there are only two half pi's in one revolution of the unit circle. To solve that for x, we would need to divide both sides by three halves or that's the same as multiplying both sides by two thirds. I over two times two thirds 
is just pi over 3. Three halves pi times two thirds is just pi. So those are our critical numbers. For the first derivative. Now, number 32, are we in the same set of instructions? Yes. Yes, it just says inflection points and concavity. So if that's all we're talking about, um, I didn't really need to even find those critical numbers because I'm not looking for relative extrema. Those are possible relative extrema. It was good practice for us to find them. You might have to find them um, in something in the homework that does ask for questions about relative extrema. For the second derivative, oh man, it was much, much uglier. I don't even want to show you how long it took me to find the second derivative. I'm just going to tell you what I got. Holy cow. Hmm. I'm just, I'm looking at my work for a second. Um, I got nine halves cosecant ugly. I factored that out and was left with a cosecant squared ugly. Plus. Cotangent squared ugly. What? <laughs> it, it took some... Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what I got, and it took time. And paper and pencil lead. have one other problem that was that ugly and all the even problems I did so don't think most of the problems in the homework are going to be like this they're not I need to know what makes this zero this is about where I changed my major to PE well can we take uh, hang, hang on to that idea just a minute I have three factors here. Nine halves is not going to be zero no matter what x is. What about this second factor? Is it ever going to equal zero? No, no it's cosecant. This plus that, uh, yes, I need to set that equal to zero and figure out how to solve it. I'm going to go ahead and save myself one step just by subtracting cotangent squared from both sides. Hmm. I th then, Kayla, I think you're right. Um, I'm going to have to write that in terms of sine and cosine and see what happens. That's one. Yes. Yeah. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, 1 over sine. Cotangent is negative, or is um, cosine. Over sine.
Right. Now, there, I do have to consider what makes the denominator zero. But if I solve that by cross multiplying, I'm going to have, that's a ratio, so I can just cross multiply sine squared 3x, 3 halves x equals negative cosine squared 3 halves x times sine squared 3 halves x. Believe it or not, we're almost there. But I would have to add this back to both sides and solve by factoring. I could, if I added this back to the left-hand side, I could factor out a sine square. And then finally, it would be better. Side by side. The, the, the only reason that I can't simply do that is I don't know if I might be multiplying both sides by zero. There are places where sine equals zero, so I can't just multiply both sides by sine. I can factor it out, though. And finally, it's going to be easy to set each of those factors equal to zero. Wherever sine of 3 halves x equals zero, and wherever cosine squared 3 halves x equals negative 1. In one revolution of the unit circle, where is sine zero? Sine is zero at the half, excuse me, at the whole pi's, zero and pi. So um, sine of, nope, I didn't mean that. I meant three halves x would either have to equal zero or three halves x would have to equal pi. Now here, when I took the square root of both sides, um, square root of 0 is still 0, so that was nice. Solution to the first equation is 0. The solution to the second equation is 2 thirds pi. Than I, thought it would. I know. I know it took forever to get there, but it cleaned up. That's the only two places where sine is zero. What about that second equation? Cosine square equals negative one. Uh. Think really hard. What's the solution to this? It, it has no real solution. It's imaginary number. You're not going to square any real number and get a negative 1. So, yay. Where did the 1 come in at? Negative 1 after the 0. When I set this equal to 0 and subtracted 1 from both sides. No, actually, I, I didn't have to think that. All I had to think is this is something squared equals negative 1, and that's never going to happen for any real number. So you it, we think it, on the other ones, the 
Yes, for this one, I thought, um, what are the angles on the interval from 0 to 2 pi? What are the angles where sine is 0, where the y-coordinate is 0? Y-coordinate 0 at 0 and pi. Now, there's only one other thing we didn't think about, and it's way back up here. Critical numbers are not only what makes the function um, 0, but it's also what? Oh, what makes the function undefined? Well, yeah, this hurts my head. Um, where is cosecant undefined? It's 1 over sine, so wherever sine is 0. How pause? Sine is 0 with the whole pause? We've already taken care of that. We've already got those as critical numbers. Actually, um, yeah, yeah. We've already handled where sine is zero, so we've already taken care of where cosecant is undefined. Where is cotangent undefined? It's cosine over sine. So it's undefined wherever sine is zero. That's all. Also 0 and 2 thirds pi? Or it's also 0 and pi, and then you solve for x. Um, I know there's one other critical point because I worked this problem before, and I'm trying to think where it came from. We found what made it 0. That's also what makes these two undefined. What makes that undefined? Cotangent is... Cosine over sine. It's zero. Just a second. It's um, undefined wherever sine is zero. Uh, snap. What are you saying? Who's talking? Shoot, shoot, shoot. Where's that other critical number coming from? Hmm. Is it coming from the first derivative? Mm -mm. I, I can tell you what it is because I've, like I said, I've worked this problem before. I'm just trying to remember where I got the four thirds pi. Um, Let me work backwards. One revolution of the unit circle. Sine is only zero so in two four places. Thirds, four thirds is the, the quarter pi. X equals four thirds pi. And so three halves x. Two pi. Um. Two. Oh man, that's that's it. That's okay. All right, knucklehead. I'm calling myself a knucklehead. Um, on the interval from 0 to 2 pi, sine is 0 at 0, at pi, and at 2 pi. Now, 2 pi is not included in, the, well, neither is 0. 0 and 2 pi themselves aren't included in the domain. But if we set that right here, if we set the 2 pi, or the ugly, if we set the 3 halves, x, the same 3 halves x that we set equal to 0 into pi, if we set it equal to 2 pi and multiply both sides by 2 thirds, there's the three critical points. Why are we doing that? Because the two, it's in the whole room. There, there are three on the interval including 0 and 2 pi. There are three times when x is 0. At 0, at 1 pi, and at 2 pi. 
when we set each of the if when we set each of those solutions equal to the argument and solved for x we got three solutions and all three of those solutions are in the interval 0 to 2 pi 2 pi was not included but that's not what x is that's what 3 halves x is and so when we solve for x we got another critical point that was included because what Pi is in the interval. One revolution of the unit circle. Well, I didn't get it for a minute until I came over to the side of my paper and worked backwards, and then it was kind of duh after that. Huh. We have a uh, interval. We we set them. We set it equal to both. You know what I'm saying? Like if we take like sine, we'll take set three halves equal to pi and two. <laughs> um, let me, Kayla. Let me finish this one. I've got to, I've got to finish it. I problem. I promise. I chose accidentally the ugliest. Yes, me too. Me too. Let's just all take a nap. Um, I chose two easy problems. The two polynomials that I showed you first were easy, and then the m most hellacious problem in the book. I'm serious. This is about where I wanted to join the Marines. Anything but finish calculus. Um, <laughs> the, the hardest problem is never going to be on the test. Never, never in a million light years could I ask you to do this problem on the test. Or, or it would have to be the only problem on the test and worth 100 points. Because you wouldn't have time to do anything else. I promise I will not do that to you. What you need to take from 4.4 today, and there are varying degrees of um, level of difficulty in finding the derivatives and what make them zero and undefined, but once you find those critical numbers, all that's left is putting those critical numbers on a number line, <coughs> critical numbers of the second derivative on a number line, and looking for the sign of the second derivative <coughs> to the left and to the right of each um, critical number. When I did that, I got, and we're only talking about the interval from 0 to 2 pi, so I'm going to put vertical lines to say, hey, I don't need to look to the left of 0 or to the right of 4 thirds pi. I got the graph to be, no, zero, crap. We're graphing zero to two pi, not zero to four thirds pi. We're not gonna look to the left of zero or to the right of two pi. I got the second derivative to be positive from zero to two thirds pi and positive from 4 thirds pi to 2 pi and negative from 2 thirds pi to 4 thirds pi. Yeah, yeah, just trust me on that, otherwise we're not going to have time. Um, that means this is concave up from 0 to 2 thirds pi and from 4 thirds pi to 2 pi, it's concave down from 2 thirds pi to 4 thirds pi. And where are the inflection points? No, inflection point's just an order pair. It's not an interval. Yeah, where are the concavity changes? And the concavity changed at 2 thirds pi, and the concavity changed at 4 thirds pi. So there are two inflection points, and I would have to find those two y values. Make sure you understand that these are intervals, and these are ordered pairs. 
It's one of the few ambiguous things in math that or intervals look like ordered pairs. You have to take them in context. <laughs> Concavity is over an interval. Inflection point is just an ordered pair. All right. Let me tell you which problems to do in the 4.4 homework and then give you a tiny bit of reassurance if I can real quickly. Um, we only talked about problems that said find the points of inflection and discuss the concavity of the graph. So I'm going to say only do one, two, three, four, five problems. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. In the box, that's what I'm taking up Friday. Nothing else. Despite the fact that I did the ugliest problem in the book as an example, which probably scared the bejesus out of you, and I didn't mean to, all you have to do is find the critical numbers of the second derivative. Put them on a number line, find the sign of the second derivative, and tell where the function's concave up, concave down, inflection points. All you have to do on those five problems.